Sometimes you've got to shout it from the mountain, louder in the valley, trusting that he's going to get you there. Sometimes you've got to welcome the wonder, wait for the answer, worship with your hands in the air. I'll praise you anywhere. Praise, give him praise, give him praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest praise. heaven shout it to the door swing wide sometimes you've got to stand on shackles brave in the battle worship with your hands held high i'll praise you anywhere praise give him praise give him praise in the highest praise give him praise give him praise in the highest Give him praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest he is worthy. Yes, he is worthy of all our praise. You believe it? Worthy of praise this morning. Faithful, faithful all my life. Blessings day and night, countless reasons why. I'll praise you anywhere, every promise kept, goodness every step, each and every breath. I'll praise you anywhere, faithful all my life. Blessings day and night, countless reasons why. I'll praise you anywhere, every promise kept. Goodness every step, each and every breath. I'll praise you anywhere. Praise, give him praise, give him praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest. He is worthy. Yes, he is worthy of all our praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest He is worthy, yes He is worthy of all I praise. Oh, you're worthy God, you're worthy Jesus, oh we will praise you. Isn't God good, church? Amen. Remember those walls that we called sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died. And he rose, those walls are rubble now. Yeah, we thank you, Lord. Remember those giants we called death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came, and he died, and he rose. Those giants are dead now. Says, this is our God, this is who he is, he loves us. This is our God, this is what he does, he saves us. And bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Yeah. Remember that that took our breath away Faith so weak that we could barely pray But he heard every word, every whisper Amen! Oh. And now those altars in the wilderness 
story of his faithfulness never once did he fail sin nobody but jesus who pulled me out of that pit he did he did who paid for all of our sin nobody but jesus who rescued me from that grave yahweh yahweh who gets the glory and praise nobody but jesus Rescue me from that grave, Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise, nobody but hell, this is our God, this is who he is, he loves us, this is our God, this is what he does, he saves us, for the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God. testify who paid for all of our sin nobody but Jesus who pulled me out of that pit he did he did who gives all of our sins oh nobody but Jesus who rescued me from that grave Yahweh Yahweh who gets the glory and praise nobody but jesus who rescued me from that pain yahweh yahweh who gets the glory and praise nobody but him this is our god this is who he is he loves us this is our god this is what he does he saves us he bore the cross beat the grave let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. Oh, your mercy never fails me on this moment. I've been heaven in your hands. Thank you, Jesus. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I have lived in the goodness of God. Yes, Jesus. Let's just thank him today, church. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. Every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. Have led me through the fire in 
darkest nights you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived of the goodness of God So, so good With every breath that I have made oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Oh yes, your goodness is running after It's running after me, yes Lord Your goodness is running after it's running after me With my life laid down I've surrendered now I give you everything Your goodness is running after It's running after me Sing it, church oh, Your goodness is running after It's running after me Your goodness is running after it's running after me With my life laid down I surrender now I give you everything Cause your goodness is running after It's running after me Oh yes, Lord, we thank you All my life, sing a church All my life you have been faithful Has he? All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Yes, Jesus All my life All my life you have been So, so good With every breath that I am made Oh, oh I will sing Of the goodness of God Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God Yes, I will sing Of the goodness of God One more time, church. All my life you have been faithful. Yes, Jesus. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Tell him one more time. All my life you have been faithful. Oh, yes, Lord, we thank you, Lord. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing. Of the goodness of God, yes, oh, I, I will sing of the goodness oh, of God. God. Yes, Lord, we thank you, God. Has God been good to you, family? We're listening to this song the other day. My wife and I and our boys, our eight-year-old and our two-year-old, were playing in the living room. I started thinking about my eight-year-old and I told my wife, 
Think of how this song applies to, to little Jared's life. If you don't know the story of my son, my son was born extremely premature. He was born at 23 weeks gestation. They told us he had an 86% chance of dying. They asked us, do you want us to try to save him? Do you want us to do what we can to try to save him? No, they said it was a 26% chance to live. And they said it's an 86% chance that he will have severe complications. And he was born and he spent four months in the hospital at Kaiser Fontana. And this church lifted him up in prayer. And so many around the world. And I was just thinking about it. I said, think of, think of the goodness of God upon Jared's life when he was in that womb. And then he came out early. And then he struggled through and he fought to stay alive. And he fought to, to be healthy and to breathe on his own and all the rest. And God is so good to let us bring him home. And over all the years, he would learn this and learn that. Maybe he was a little behind from other kids and he was delayed. But little by little we said, man, this kid, he's doing so well. And through God's grace and his mercy, he's an amazing kid. He's going to be right here tomorrow morning when we have this Cowboy VBS tomorrow. Amen. And, and God allowed him to live. And God allowed him to not have any severe complications. A total miracle that God allowed us to see. And I know this is my story, but you have your story. When God showed up, he did what only he can do by his grace and we cried out and he's known before we were even born when we were in the womb his plans for us and he knew that he had already sent his son to die for our sins and that he would draw us to himself so that we would receive Christ one day he's been good amen So I just, um, I'm sorry for talking so long. I love you, church. Those of you that knew that and prayed, we just want to thank you again all these years later for praying for our boy. And we have our little two-year-old, Jonathan. He's just crazy. He'll just jump off cliffs if he can. So God has been good. Let's sing that, that, choir, that chorus one more time. You consider what God has done for you. You give him thanks in your heart. He hears your voice. He knows your story. And he has been good. Amen, church. Let's sing it out. All my life, you have been faithful. Lift it up. Yes, Jesus. All my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will speak of the goodness of God. All my life, yes, Lord. All my life you have been faithful. Yes, you have, God. Oh, yes, Lord. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing. Of the goodness of God, yes, I will sing of the goodness of God. Yes, Lord. We love you, Lord. You first loved us, we love you back. You have been good to us, God, beyond measure. And you are always good, Lord. There have been times when we've cried out for a miracle and you said yes. There have been times we've cried out for a miracle and you said wait. There have been times we've cried out for a miracle and you said no. Because you know best. 
and you're in control and you love us. You love our kids and grandkids and our siblings and our parents and our grandparents. And you know best and so we trust you, Lord. And we just thank you, God, that you've been so good. So God, we're asking that this morning, even as you've already begun, that you would just continue the work you've begun today. That your Holy Spirit would be poured out. That you would save souls this morning in this place, those watching, God. That you would draw sinners to repentance, Lord. For those of us that follow you, Lord, we want to follow you closer, Lord. We want to abide in Jesus daily, Lord. Fill us with your spirit, God. So we're here, God, that you would speak and that we would hear and that you would give us the power to apply it, Lord. Have your way. Be glorified, Lord. Thank you and we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said amen and amen. Let's give the Lord the applause, family. Man, God is so good. Family, you may have a seat if you're here in the house. Thank you for coming to church today. What a beautiful day. Thank God for this cool space. And thank God that we're about to have VBS. We are standing in the middle of like cowboy land up here. Can we give it up for those that created this back here? This is amazing. So VBS, which stands for Vacation Bible School, it's an event that for us, it lasts five days, Monday through Friday, starts tomorrow. The kids in elementary school are going to flood this sanctuary. And they're going to get here at probably about 8, start checking in. Be here till about noon or 1230 every day. And God's going to move. Amen. That God would move in these kids' lives and draw them to him. And that they would be fed the word of God and they'd worship with all their hearts. And so we're looking forward to it. Just wanted to ask you guys, please keep all the families and the kiddos in prayer this week. As well as all the servants. We have an army of servants that are going to take care of the kids. And so we're looking forward to that. This year's theme is called Wanted. And so we're going to have an awesome time this week. With that said, let's check out the announcement video this morning. Let's see what else is coming up. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. We have some exciting events coming soon, so let's take a look at this week's announcements. VBS officially starts tomorrow. We're excited to welcome hundreds of kids onto our church campus to enjoy an awesome week of skits, worship, Bible studies, outdoor activities, crafts, and snacks. If you haven't registered your kids yet, there's still time. Stop by the VBS tent in the courtyard after service if you'd like to help. And parents, don't forget, we encourage you to arrive early each day this week as check-in begins at 8.15 a.m. Today is the last day to register for kickball games at Ayala Park in Chino on Saturday, July 22nd. Games will be played from 5 to 7, and the cost is only $5 per player. The event is open to men, women, and kids 12 years or older, and no experience is needed. We hope to see you there. This month, our church is celebrating 42 years of ministry. On Wednesday, July 26th, join us for an evening service as we celebrate the Lord's faithfulness for more than four decades. We'll enjoy an extended time of worship and rejoice in the work God has done through Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. Join your church family for our annual summer baptism on Sunday, July 30th after second service. If you have a personal relationship with Jesus and would like to make a public declaration of your transformed life, we invite you to come and be baptized with one of our ministers. There's no need to sign up, just a maturity and understanding of what baptism represents. Our athletics ministry has two nights of softball planned for the month of August. Men and co-ed teams will play on Saturday nights, August 5th and August 19th, at West Wind Park in Ontario. Games will start at 5.30 p.m., and the last game will end around 9 p.m. The cost is just $15 per player per game and is open to anyone aged 15 and up. The Bible teaches that when a man and a woman come together in marriage, they are to become one. This relationship supersedes any other, which is why we strive to provide opportunities for couples to strengthen their bond. We're excited to announce our upcoming couples conference. We'll kick things off on Friday, August 11th with a fun-filled evening featuring Christian illusionist and author, Danny Ray. After Danny's presentation, you'll be treated to dessert and coffee. Then the conference will begin on Saturday, August 12th with Pastor Sandy Adams from Calvary Chapel, Stone Mountain. We are also welcoming guest speakers, Jason and Christy Duff from the Garden Fellowship in Indio. Tickets for one or both days are on sale now, along with a lunch option for Saturday. Whether you're visiting for the first time or have made Chino Valley your home, we're thankful you're here today. Everything you've heard is just a snapshot of our upcoming events and opportunities to get involved. To find out what else is happening and to sign up or register, visit our website at calvaryccv.org. You can also download our free app and check out the events tab. 
Thank you for joining us today. As we prepare our hearts and minds for the Bible study, don't forget to place your cell phone on silent. And please help us limit distractions by staying seated until service is over. Thank you for being with us and have a blessed week. Well, good morning, church family, and welcome to Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. If this is your first time here, we want to say welcome and God bless you. We want to welcome those who are joining us online this morning and those who are sweltering in the patio. You guys can come on in. It's nice and air conditioned in here. Uh, come on in. This is a time in our service where we worship the Lord through our tithes and offerings. But before we do so, just a couple of announcements. Please keep Pastor David and Marie in prayer as they'll be returning home this evening, Lord willing. On, on Thursday, uh, Pastor David and Marie went, uh, flew out to Albuquerque and they went to Ruidoso, uh, New Mexico, and where Pastor uh, did a teaching for pastors and leaders there. And then today, he taught at Calvary Chapel New Harvest, which is in Los Lunas, uh, New Mexico. And Lord willing, they'll be home tonight and will be joining us for our Wednesday evening service at 7 p.m. in the chapel as Pastor David's been taking us through the Book of Romans, and we'll also be celebrating communion as a church family. Uh, we have our young adults, we have our young adults, uh, sorry, I had a text message, our young adults meeting coming in at 7.30 on Monday evening in the courtyard from the ages of 18 to 28. If you fall in that age range, I want to invite you to come out and join our young adults ministry uh, as they've been having our Bible study in the young adults ministry and worship under the courtyard under the lights and under the stars and just want to invite you guys to come out and join us uh, for the men that are joined that join us for our tuesday morning men's study uh 6 30 we have a little bit of a change because of ebs we'll be meeting in the chapel tuesday morning at 6 30. Uh, men as you know it's we have been having a study through second kings and want to invite you guys to come out and join us but it will be in the chapel and then as mentioned we will have uh, our study on wednesday evening at 7 p.m as Pastor David's taken us through the book of Romans, and we will be having communion as a church family. One of the announcements that was mentioned in the video announcements was our couples, uh, our couples conference, and which will be Friday evening and Saturday. Uh, you can actually go to our website and register for the early registration discount price. You can go online and see that as Sandy Adams will be here, uh, the Duffs will be here. And then on, uh, on Friday night, it says that we have an illusionist. Now, some people, I've heard some people say that's magic and sorcery. No, it's not. Uh, come join and find out. It's not magic or sorcery or anything like that. Uh, he ties that in with deception. So come check it out. If you have any, you want to see for yourself, then uh, husbands and wives, uh, invest the time to come spend time together on that. So if you register now, you can register online. Uh, through the 31st of July, you'll have a, there's a discount that uh, that are there, and all the pricing options are there. Uh, on July 30th, as mentioned in our in our uh, bulletin or video announcements, that we have our baptism. For those that are going to get baptized and want to purchase a baptism shirt, you can actually go to the chapel store after service and pick up your baptism shirt. I think it's on the screen. Yeah, there it is, right there. It's on the screen there. Uh, you can go. On, you can actually go to the bookstore and pick that up, or the mini chapel or the chapel store and pick that up there, available there. If you do not know where the chapel store is at, you go out these doors, make a left, and it'll say chapel store. You can go there and purchase your baptism shirt. And then men, we have our men's barbecue on Friday evening, August 18th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. Tickets are on sale now. Uh, for $6, you can get a hamburger or a cheeseburger. I said beverage last, uh, last uh, service soft drink i want to say beverage because some of you guys might start thinking so i wanted to say soft drink and chips so that's available you can actually go to the gazebo or go online and purchase your tickets there uh we're going to spend time in god's word we're going to have fellowship and then we're going to have dinner so men you can stop by and pick up your your uh tickets today and buy one for a friend and then we have our israel 2024 informational meeting on sunday july 23rd here in the sanctuary immediately after second service anybody that's wanting to go to israel or has been planning to go to israel or has signed up for israel or just have questions come join us for our informational meeting that will be here immediately after second service july 23rd for any questions you may have and then afterwards if you feel like registering then feel free to do so and the dates for the register for israel are may 7th to the 18th 
And, uh, and as Pastor David and Marie uh, invite you to come join the church family in this once-in-a-lifetime trip to the Holy Land. As we now focus our worship on the Lord with our tithes and offerings, you know that when we give to the Lord in anything we do, whether we give our time, we give our service, and we give our tithes and offerings, we're actually worshiping the Lord. And there are a lot of ministries that go on here at our church as a result of giving. And many people's lives are being transformed because of the giving that takes place in this church. We have uh, skate outreach parks. We go into the prisons. We have different variety of ministries that allow the gospel to leave these walls. And one day, as you will be in heaven, somebody may come up and say, thank you for your giving because of that, through this ministry, I was saved. And we'll never understand this side of heaven of what our giving goes to. And when we do that, not only are we furthering God's kingdom, but we're bringing worship and honor to the Lord. And in a moment, we'll have the ushers come by and pass around an agape bucket for those that are here this morning and want to give their gifts to the Lord. For those that are watching online on Facebook and YouTube, there's a link in the chat box that open, uh, opens up a page to give, and you're able to give your gifts to the Lord. And then for those that are here this morning and brought your gift and want to uh, give electronically, we have kiosks that are in the foyers. But this is a time that we're able to worship the Lord and say, Lord, not only do I worship you, but thank you for everything you have given me. So as the offering buckets come by, we'll remain seated and we'll have another worship song. And once that do that's done, Jared will cue you to stand up as we will continue to worship the Lord. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this privilege of giving back to you. And Lord, we're so thankful for the many, many various ministries that we offer here, Lord, that we're able to reach beyond these walls for your kingdom. And Lord, we are so thankful, Lord, that we're able to come and worship here, worship you through song, through your word, and through giving. So Lord, we ask that it brings glory and honor to your name. We ask, Lord, that your kingdom is furthered. And Lord, we do lift up our guest speaker, Pastor David Trujillo, as he brings forth the message this morning that our lives and our hearts will be transformed by your word and by your spirit. So, Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand, church. Sing it out. We'll sing the song forever and amen. And the angels cry. Holy, all creation cries. Holy, you are lifted high. Holy, holy. Here 
We love you, Lord. We join with the hosts of heaven and sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and is to come. Would you put the healthy fear of you, Lord, in our hearts? That we would reverence you and honor you, Lord. Would you cleanse us of sin, Lord? Lead us in the way of righteousness, God. Would you open our ears right now to hear your word? Soften our hearts, God, to receive it. Fill us with your spirit to live it, Lord. Have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. We all said, amen. Let's give the Lord the applause, family. Hey, before you have a seat, family, why don't we turn to one another today and let's say hello to a few folks. Meet somebody new. Say, God bless you. Isn't God good all the time, amen? I think John, is John coming back out? Mata? Yes. <laughs> Let's welcome John Mata. Thank you, Jared. Uh, you know, pastor's not here, obviously, and usually he would do something like this. And today we have a young man from our congregation that is getting going off into the military. And as a church family, we... Uh, we thought we would pray for him. So is Diego Gonzalez Ortiz here? And if he is, can you please stand up? He's back there. Diego's going into the army and he's leaving July 23rd and his basic training will be at Fort Benning, Georgia where it's nice and cool there, right? And he'll be stationed after that at Fort Lewis, Washington, which will be really cooler then. And then once he's done, he'll be part of the 11th Infantry Regiment. And young man, thank you for serving our country. 
And thank you for, amen. And we look forward to see what the Lord and how the Lord's going to use you and the testimony that you will be serving our country. So we'd like to pray for you and uh, may the Lord's blessing be upon you. So let's pray, church family. Father, we thank you so much that we can come before you, Lord. And Lord, this morning, we lift up Diego before you. As he is serving our country, the sacrifice and the time away from family, Lord, for our freedom. And Lord, we know that even the ultimate freedom is in you. So Lord, as Diego goes to Fort Benning, Lord, may your hand of protection be upon him. May your hand be upon his family. And Lord, that you would keep him safe, Lord, and that he would be light and salt where he's going. So Lord, thank you for the sacrifices he is making for our country, Lord, that you would bless him, that you would bless his family. And we ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. Congratulations. I'd like to introduce a a, a close friend to our church family. He's a close friend to myself and and Pastor David. He was actually here, part of our church for a while, and we all know and love him. Let's please welcome David Trujillo from Calvary Chapel, South Los Angeles. What's up, what's up, what's up? Well, good morning. I'm glad to be here. Let's open up our Bibles to Titus chapter 2. You know, um, I feel like the, the shepherd dog on the Wiley Coyote and the Road Runner with this scene back here. Notice I said the shepherd dog because he's a little chunky, not like the coyote. But anyways, we're in Titus chapter 2. Won't you stand with me, please, so we can read the scriptures? As we give reverence to the word of God. Beginning in verse 11, I'll just be covering verses 11 and 12, but I'm going to read down to verse 15 and get into what I've entitled, Don't Disgrace God's Grace. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. And purify for himself his own special people. Zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke without authority. Let no one despise you. And I'll do that, Lord. Let's pray. And Father, we come before you and we thank you for this morning. We ask that you will speak to our hearts. Lord, that you will help us to understand the seriousness of walking in holiness. Help us, Lord, not to be apart, to set ourselves apart from the world for your work, for your kingdom purposes, Lord. Convict anyone who is in sin. Encourage anyone who is discouraged, Lord. Father, meet us exactly where we need to be met this morning. So that when we leave this place, we will continue to be the salt and the light of here in this darkened world. In Jesus' name we say... Amen. You may have a seat. As a Christian, for those that are believers, when I say a Christian, I'm talking about someone who is a follower of Jesus Christ, okay? So as a follower of Jesus Christ, we could either bring glory to God or we can blaspheme his name. When Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans chapter 2, verses 24, he stated that, that God's name was being blasphemed. Because of some of the people who were supposed to be believers were living a different life. So as Christians, we can either bring glory to God or we can, bring, or we can blaspheme his name. Now, I need you to know that God is glorified when we live holy lives. And when we're bearing much fruit for his kingdom. In fact, in John 15 verse 8, Jesus himself said that by this my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. But God is blasphemed when we live carnal lives or worldly lives. When we live worldly lives, we can disgrace the grace of God. So worldliness disgraces God's grace, but holiness portrays a a heart of gratitude to the grace of God. So my prayer is for us 
that the Lord may keep us from, from being a disgrace to the grace of God. Now, I've heard people say before, hey, listen, uh, that person is a worldly Christian, which is a contradiction, contradiction in terms. You see, we need to understand that there's no such thing as a, there shouldn't be a such thing as a worldly Christian. There should be godly Christians. Worldly Christian is someone who's, who's of the world. A godly Christian is someone who is of God. Now listen closely. Someone once said that we might as well speak of a heavenly devil as to speak of a worldly Christian. So there shouldn't be no such thing as a worldly Christian. Now, there is so much truth to the fact that, as someone once said, the world has become so churchy and the church has become so worldly. Again, the world has become so churchy and the church has become so worldly. Now, I want to talk about that because I believe that we're living in the last days. And in a time in which we should be living, as we just read, looking for our glorious appear, the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, a lot of us are not looking forward to his return. Though we might say it, our lives speaks another, another language or says another thing. You know, we're living a compromised life. We're living a carnal life. And, and, and to you, I would say this. Listen, I pray that you open up your heart and that you listen to what the Spirit has to say. You know, I come to you today as David, but also as a man of God. Just like Nathan when he confronted David. Or Elijah when he confronted Ahab. You know, I'm coming to you to, to ask you, are you living a holy life or are you living a worldly life? I pray that your answer is a holy life. And the way to live a holy life is by simply doing what the Bible has called us to do. And that is to separate ourselves from, the th from this world, or from the system of this world. Now again... I want you to understand that God has commanded us to separate ourselves from this world. Turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. And I'm going to have you turn to various scriptures, so please warm up your fingers and follow with me. Amen? Chapter 2, verse 15. 1 John 2, 15. And this is what we read. Now listen to the instructions from this man of God. It says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of this world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Now notice it says that we are not to love the world. Now when it's, the word world there, in the Greek it's cosmos, which simply means a system, an order of things, and a philosophy. It's kind of like if we're saying, you know, uh, the world of sports. It has its own philosophy. Sports has its own philosophy, right? We, we use terminologies and, and we do certain things to fit into that terminology or to that philosophy. Well, guess what? The word word there in the Greek simply means that a system, an order of things, or a philosophy. And Scripture tells us that we can't love this world's system and then say that we love God at the same time. It's impossible. Jesus says, if you love me, right, you keep my commandments. So Jesus is calling us to a life of obedience to his word, which will display a love for God. So you can tell me you love the Lord with all your heart, and you can show up on a Sunday morning, but then go to work the next day or go to school the next day and then live a carnal life. That just shows me that you really don't love the Lord. You love the world. And if that's you, man, I'm calling for you to repent, to turn from your ways. Because the reality is we're in disobedience. And when we're in disobedience, we're only setting ourselves up for failure. At least as it pertains to the will of God. So it is important that scripture tells us through the spirit of God that we are not to love the system of the world. But we are to love God with all our being. Amen. But I want to draw your attention to this world system. And how we're to separate ourselves from it. Now, I'm going to give you a few things that I want you to jot down if you're taking notes regarding the world system. Number one, the world has a ruler. The world has a, a, a prince, according to John chapter 12, verse 31. That prince is Satan himself. In fact, in John 14, 30, and in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, the Holy Spirit reveals that to us. Now, we know that Satan, right now, has temporary control of the system. 
Now, we know that one day when Christ comes back and establishes his kingdom here upon the earth for a thousand years, Satan's control is over, right? But until then, we do know that the enemy is the one who's controlling the system of this world. That's why when you look at the world, right, the world is opposite of the things of God, right? God calls for holiness. God calls for righteousness. God calls for living a sober life. And yet, at the same time, the opposite of that is what the devil offers, right? A drunken life, right? A life of wickedness, a life of compromise, a life of sin. So again, understand that the enemy has temporary control of the system. In fact, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, John wrote this. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Scholars have said that this phrase, lies under the sway of the wicked one, literally means this. And I like this, quote, cradled in the lap of the wicked one. So Satan has this world system in his arms and he's rocking it to sleep. You hear me? He is in control today. Now the second thing I want you to notice is that the world system is opposed to the grace of God. Again, second thing is that this world, this world system opposes the grace of God or is opposed to God's grace. Behind this system, we know that there is a mastermind. And that mastermind is Satan himself. In fact, Satan has a very complicated organization, a network of wickedness. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, this is what we read. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of, this dark, of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. A principality is an organization under the leadership of a prince. So we know that Satan, right, who is the mastermind behind this, has this complicated organization, a network of wickedness, as mentioned. But also there is a great conspiracy. In Scripture, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, this, this, this great conspiracy is called the mystery of lawlessness. The mystery of lawlessness. So we have a prince. This world has a prince. This world has a system that opposes the grace of God. And number three, this world has a philosophy. There is a luring network of ideas, a luring network of values that are mas masterfully knitted to enslave the guilty, but also to entrap the innocent. Paul calls it the spirit of the world, according to 1 Corinthians 2.12, or a worldly spirit. Paul also calls it... Um, Cause it the wisdom of the world, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 19. All this to tell you this. Listen, the devil is no joke. The devil knows what's up. He is cunning. He is deceiving. You hear me? This is part of his philosophy. He's embedded it into this world. And this philosophy is taking many to hell. Peter calls it the pollutions of this world in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. So there is a philosophy. And in, and in, and in, its, and in it, I'm sorry, it's, it, you find it in the movies. You find it in television, right? You find it in our news. You find it in world religion. And when you look at this philosophy of the world, doesn't it look innocent? Doesn't it look beautiful sometimes? And sometimes it even feels like it's harmless. But this is a system that comes with great danger and eternal consequences. Are you listening to me? I tell you because if you're not, if you're, if your eyes are not open to the things that are happening, man, you're, 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 you have been caught up in the things of the world, man. You've been, you've been, you've been sidetracked from the things of God. We need to open our eyes or allow the spirit to open our eyes and to show us this wicked and evil philosophy of the enemy. That is in the world. You see, like I mentioned, in the movies. I mean, how many times have you gone to the movies and they're always pushing their agendas on us, right? They try to sneak it in, right? Even through cartoons. You can't even see Buzz Lightyear because you know what I'm saying? They got some hidden agenda there. You know what I'm talking about? The LGBT has their, they're pushing their agenda to us. I mean, they do it in the movies. They do it in television, right? In commercials, Especially last month, right? They were pushing it in our commercials, in the news. Man, you can't even trust the news because they're constantly lying and also pushing their philosophy on us as well. And even in religion. 
how heartbreaking it is when you see people that call themselves Christian hanging flags, pride flags, right? You see this philosophy that no doubt comes with eternal consequences. And number four, we see that the world has a purpose. This world has a purpose. There is, there is a strategic plan and a fixed purpose of this world system. And God's people, that is me and you, who are recipients of the grace of God, are to listen closely, to deny worldly lust, as we read in verse 12 here in Titus chapter 2, where it says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and unworthy lust. So we who are believers, those who are followers of Christ, are to deny these worldly lusts. The question is this, are you? Are you denying these worldly lusts? Or are you bathing in them and participating in them? As we'll see later, it's going to come with a great price. But this world today is hostile toward the things of God. The world hates Jesus, as noted in John chapter 7, verse 7. One thing that I have noted, listen, people of the world don't really hate Jesus. Nature doesn't hate Jesus. But there is a system that can't stand Jesus. You see, when you think about it, they don't hate the baby Jesus, right? Especially when it comes to Christmas. They love the baby Jesus, right? They don't, they don't hate the healing Jesus, right? The one that, that you pray to and he heals them. Oh, yes, oh, praise Jesus because he healed me. They don't hate the, the, the healing Jesus or the religious Jesus, right? Or, or the one who is all accepting Jesus. They hate the Jesus that, that states what's right and wrong. That's the Jesus they hate. So today we know, listen closely, that there's a hostile there, a, a hostility towards God, towards the Jesus that we serve. They hate the Jesus, again, as mentioned, who's always exposing darkness. For he exposes the darkness and reveals the true nature of this system. And here's the crazy thing. Haven't you noticed that when you talk to people about this world system, it, it, it just seems like it's going right over their head? And the reason why is very simple. I mean, because they're blind, they're dead. You know, you, you tell a man, this world system is corrupt. This world system is pulling you away from God. You can end up in hell if you don't stop following that world system. But when you talk to them, it's like you're talking to a wall, right? You, you, you probably will convert a wall before anything if the spirit don't get involved there. But I'm telling you the reason why is because they're blinded. The Bible says that the prince of this world has blinded their eyes. They don't understand. They can't see it. That's why you can't quit on them. That's why you can't get frustrated or irritated over them. That's why you got to pray for patience. That's why you got to pray for grace. That's why you got to pray for endurance. Just like Jesus. For the Bible says that joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. The, God, the Bible says that, because, that God demonstrated his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. You see, Jesus understood where we were and what had to be done in order that we may respond to this love that he offers. Same with us. Because people are blinded or people are spiritually dead, you can talk to your blue in your face and they won't understand. They won't see it. That's why you have to pray and you have to ask God to open their eyes that they may see that this world system is destroying them. Which is only a means that the devil uses to, to fulfill his evil desire. For we know that the devil comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. You hear me? Here's the crazy thing. You guys has escaped it, man, by the grace of God. But guess what? I know that there's loved ones in our families, man, that are blinded right now. And they need for us, even though they might not show it right now, they need you to be faithful for them. So, that, so when the day comes for God to speak to their heart, they may respond and, not, and, not, and, and come to a saving knowledge of Christ. But again... The world today don't see it. They can't see it. Therefore, we can't get frustrated or give up on them. We must persevere because every soul is purchased. Amen. Jesus then gives a warning to every true believer, every true follower of the Lord who desires to flirt with this world. There's a, a warning. In John chapter 15, verse 18, he said, if the world hates you, know that he hated me before he hated you. So Jesus is saying, listen, this world... That some of us in this room are still trying to keep one half of our foot on, on, on. You know what I'm saying? Let me tell you something. The world will hate you. If the world's not hating you, something is up with your walk with God. 
Because I noticed something. Whenever you're walking in godliness, Paul told Timothy, you will suffer persecution. That's just the bottom line. Now, I'm not talking about you're going to get stoned. Some of us might. You know, I remember when me and Swanya, we went to Haiti just a few uh, months ago, and we almost got stoned up there, man. By the grace of God, he saved us, man. And so, but I remember just thinking, oh, Lord, not right now. Right now, like, this is going to hurt. I, you know, please deliver us. And he did, praise the Lord. But, but, you know, some people might get stoned. Some people might get shot. Some people might just get persecuted through, you know, through, through, through you know, people alienate you. People are talking about you, gossiping about you, slandering you. Here's the thing. When you stand up for righteousness, when you stand up against the world with the word of God, you can, uh, I can assure you, you're going to get persecuted. Jesus said, if it hated me, it's going to hate you too. Now, here's the thing. Do you, want the, do you want the world that hated Jesus to love you, to accept you? <laughs> then live a compromised life. And you see that it will. But this is what scripture tells you today. In James chapter 4 verse 4 it says, adulterers. An adulterer says, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Think about what James said. Pretty much he's saying, listen. If you want to befriend this world system, you're actually shaking your, your fist in the face of God. In fact, if that is you, I want you to know that you are declaring war against God himself. See, God doesn't want us to be friendly with the world. God wants us to live for the heavenly world. And to preach and to, and, and to work in this world as we proclaim God's truth that will bring hope and everlasting life through the saving gospel. So again... We have the world has its prince, number one. Number two, the world system is opposed to God's grace. Number three, the world has a philosophy. Number four, the world has a purpose, right? Uh, number five, the world has a people. There are people who are in this world's system, as Luke 16, verse 8 notes. Listen, we're not to hate the people. We are to hate the system that has enslaved them. You hear me? We are not to hate the people, but we are to hate the system. Look, last month it was hard for a lot of Christians. I mean, we did so much to preach the gospel. And because LGBT was highlighted, right, that's why I'm kind of mentioning a little bit right now. I'll tell you this. I don't hate them. I don't hate them at all. I love them. And because we love them and God loves them, we need to reach them. We're, we're not to engage in them and call them names and belittle them and stuff like that. You know, it trips me out, man, when there's Christians out there that are talking down to them. Don't you understand that when you do that, you're closing a door for you to share God's love with them? We need to love them. We, don't, we, we hate the system. We hate the sin. But these are the ones that God has brought in our life so that we can share with them God's truth. So again, but this world has a system. The world has his people, its people. So because you are not of the world, because you are of God, don't be surprised. You hear me? When the world does not accept you. Because the world won't accept you. You hear me? Especially if you're living a life of faithfulness to God. If you are, then you can be assured that the world will not accept, accept you. So don't be surprised when we have it hard. As a child of God. You see this world is not our home. What we have someone said. Where we are headed. And what we believe are completely opposite to this world system. In fact he goes on and states our faith starts at a different source. It follows a different course. And it ends at a different conclusion. So don't be surprised when we find ourselves going against the tide. Going against the tide, going against the floor. You know, a long time ago when I used to attend this church at, at the bookstore back then, when you guys had a, a bookstore, there was this uh, tape, I'm not tape, this bumper sticker. It was a cool sticker, man. It was a little fish, you know, going downstream and going opposite of the little fish was, was like piranha, these, uh, uh, you know, these, 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 you know, these fish that bite, you know, whatever they are, you know. And, and he's kind of, you see these fish with big old teeth, you know, and these little fish are swimming through it. And then it says right there, go against the flow. I used to love that sticker. Because it spoke, it, it encouraged me. You know what, that as Christians, we're going to have to go against the flow. We're going to have to go against the tide. So if you're going against the tide, listen, don't be surprised when things get hard for you. 
Because Christ never called us to a life of comfort, but a life of holiness and faithfulness. And when you're being faithful, you're going to have a hard time. But don't worry. God is with you, man. God is with you, and he's going to see you through it. And through it, he's going to build you up to make you the man and the woman that he wants you to be so that you can continue to bring glory and honor to his name. Amen? So again, understand that it will be hard, but it's because we're going against the flow. Now, we are members of the human world, no doubt. We live in a physical world, but we are not to be a part of Satan's world system. In fact, we are to separate ourselves from them. And that's why notice again in verse 11, he says, for the grace of God that brings salvation. The first thing, notice here that it is God's grace that brought salvation. You are saved by grace. You hear me? Not of work, the Bible says, lest any man shall boast. We are saved simply because God is good. You hear me? You are saved by grace. Man, that blesses my heart. So it was through grace that we receive salvation, that salvation came. Notice, has appeared to all men. 1 John chapter 1, verses 16 through 17 tells us that grace, grace came by Christ. So it said it appeared to all men, teaching us. Here's another thing. Grace has taught us. What? What does grace teach us? That we are to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, it says. And how do you do that? As you pursue a, a life soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age today. So how do you avoid living a life that is carnal? Living a holy life and a righteous life. That's how you do it. Putting all your hard effort, all your strength, everything that it takes within you to, to bless God through a life of righteousness. As you're occupying your life and trying to please him. I, I, I'll tell you this, man. <laughs> you're not going to give in to the flesh. You're not going to fall for the system of this world. But what I see today, listen closely and sad to say that many Christians are giving up on God. Many Christians are giving up in their pursuit because it's too hard. Or, or it's, there's too much persecution. Or it's not fun. Oh, man. May God open your eyes to see that Jesus was faithful for us, man. Have you ever wondered? Could you imagine if Jesus would have quit on the way to the cross? Could you imagine what would have happened to us? But because he did it, because he loved us, <laughs> he followed through. And now we are the recipients of his faithfulness to the Lord, to his Father. Listen, we need to do the same. We need to look at the cross and be motivated by his faithfulness that we may be faithful. And we do that as we live soberly, righteously, and we live godly in this present world. In John, in John 17, 14, it says that we're not of the world. We're in the world, but we're not of it. We're from God's world. Paul, under the inspiration of God's spirit, said that our first duty after being saved by grace, you know what it was? To separate from the world. Separate from the system of the world. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, Paul said, I beseech you therefore, or I, I beg you, I plead with you, he says, brethren, speaking to believers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In fact, Romans is a short verse. In Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 12, pretty much that's a short version of the book of Romans. But here we see that Paul states that we need to separate ourselves from the world. In fact, the word church in Scripture, simply means a group of people that is called out. So the church is to be called, it's called out of the world, to be different, to separate. In fact, the true Christian ought to stand out in today's world system. You hear me? We are to stand out. People are to take notice that you're a Christian. You know one thing I like, man? You know, when, when, when I was working in the world, man, when I mean by that, I had a secular job, I'll tell you this, man. You know, my job, I, I wanted people to, even though I, I was called to work there at that time, my, my goal was to have my, my, my fellow employees, right, to catch me reading my Bible, to catch me praying for my lunch, to catch me talking about Jesus. You know, I wanted to stand, stand out. 
You know, and I remember when, when I remember when I was working for DHL, I tried to make it so, so um, noticeable because I wanted them to come up to me and to ask me about who, why do I believe what I believe. I wanted them to ask me why I'm a Christian. So I put myself in a position where, where, where I, I made that, that can happen or, or that opportunity can come. And it only happens as you're living in obedience. You see, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, Jesus says, you are the salt. Jesus said, you are the light. Think about that. He talks about a light up in a hill, right, that cannot be hidden. I mean, how many of us have driven down the 60 freeway, right? And when you're driving there, man, you look up in the hills and you see all these houses with their lights on, right? You can drive for a few miles and you still see those lights. Well, that's what Jesus wants us to be. He wants us to stand out that when people look at our life, they know that we belong to God. They know that we love God. You hear me? Is that the life you're living? Are you standing out? That's what God expects from us. Because he has been good to us and we sang it, right? It's time for us to be good to him. And the way you do that is by being faithful, by being the light of the world. Now listen, we are not called to try to win a popularity contest, right? We are not called to make enemies, and don't get me wrong here. But also, we must not betray Jesus or his word. You hear me? We are not called to make enemies, and we are not called also to betray Jesus and his word. There was a Baptist preacher who once said, quote, We hear a lot about the separation of church and state. Well, the message the church needs to hear today is a message of separation of the church and the world. And that's why I prayed, and, I, and as I put this study together, man, I'm telling you, this is what God put in my heart. Because look, man, I'm being honest with you, man. A lot of people today hide in the church. They're holy. I mean, it's easy to be a Christian right here. It's easy to lift your hands. It's easy to say amen or praise the Lord when you're amongst other believers. But what happens when you're at work? And your and your co your co-workers are 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 talking, you know, are, are, are saying dirty jokes. What happened when when you're tempted to steal? What what about the home? I mean, what, what are your kids saying about you? What does your wife or your husband say about you? Right? What about what about you know in the parking lot, right? I mean, think about it. It's easy to to try to fake someone out here. I mean, you can fake anybody. But what when you're alone? Do you have integrity? Do you really have a genuine relationship with God? Are you truly holy when no one's watching? You see, I believe, as I mentioned, that there's a lot of Christians today that have not separated themselves from the world and they're starting to look a lot like the world. Churches that start looking a lot like the world. Oh, my prayer is that God will speak to your heart today. And that's why we read in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, right? John gave us the warning. That, you know, you can't love God in the world. You just can't. Now, Paul gave some examples in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 through 7. And I want you to turn your Bibles there to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2. In verse 6. He mentions someone that I want to spend the rest of the morning just sharing with you guys regarding this worldly individual who I believe was saved. Simply by the grace of God. In 2 Peter chapter 2, in verse 6, notice. It says this. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. Condemned them to destruction. Making them an example to those who afterward will live ungodly. Notice that. And delivered righteous Lot. Who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. So here you have Lot that is introduced as an example who was righteous and just, we read. But notice, he was in Sodom and Gomorrah. He wasn't in Sodom, but he was being tormented. Listen, if you're truly a Christian, you cannot be comfortable in a system that is against God. You hear me? Now, if you can be at a party, drinking, flirting, when you're married, right, and, all, and not feel convicted, 
Man, I'm telling you right now, the Bible talks about in 1 John that, man, you're probably not saved. You're probably not saved. Or, and if you are saved, you have quieted the spirit in your heart, and now you're past conviction. And I'm telling you, wake up before the Lord gets your attention. And he will. You know why? Because he loves you. How many times have we found in Scripture guys that were in sin and the Lord, when they thought they've gotten away. For instance, David, when he committed murder and adultery. Remember what happened? A year had passed when he thought that everyone had forgotten. But God didn't forget. What did he do? He sends Nathan. And he tells him, hey, you know, he tells him the little story about the little lamb. You remember the story. And then afterwards pretty much tells him, listen, you are that man, man. You took someone's precious, per, you know, wife and you, and you killed him and you took her. And then he tells him, listen, if you, he told him, and he, he told him he was going to die. You read it in context. It says that he was going to die, but he repented. And God showed him grace. But he didn't curse him and says the sword will not depart from his home. And you know the life of David. David was miserable. And he saw a lot of violence in his home. You see, the Lord loved David. He didn't let him get away with it. He went after him at the right time. And he brought him back. Listen. God, if you're here and you're worldly and you think you're getting away, you're not. You know, time will come where God will come after you because he loves you. He loves you. And he's able to do, he'll, either, he'll either snap you out, out of that state that you're in or he will call you home as John chapter 5 talks about. Sins that lead to death. You know, let me just mention this quickly. I had a friend of mine who, uh, who was in the same gang that I was. He got out of prison after doing, I believe it was 15 years. When he came out, man, I was really impressed by this guy because he had a, knowledge, a lot of knowledge of the word of God. In fact, I even thought, man, this guy can be used. So we started pour, I started pouring into him. And slowly but surely, I saw this man go from not doing anything for the Lord for doing a lot for the Lord. He was even teaching our men's studies at one time, you know. And I remember he backslid. He ended up backsliding. And it was within a week or two. I don't remember exactly, but it was within that time. Little did I realize that he started compromising a little bit, as we'll share in a few moments. Ultimately, what happened, next time he knew, he's full out in sin. He started doing drugs. He started from weed to crack, and eventually he started doing heroin. And I remember finally when he, I finally made connections with him, and I, and I called him, and we were able to talk, and he's telling me, God won't take me back. God won't receive me. And I'm pleading with him, nah, bro, don't be a fool. That's the devil speaking to your ear. God loves you, man. He's waiting for you with open arms, and I'm sharing every, every scripture I can think of. I'm throwing at him, trying to fight for his, for his life. And finally, I got him to agree that he would come to church with me on Sunday. It was on a Saturday. And I was excited because he was going to come back that Sunday morning. The plan was that I was going to wait for him in the front. Well, in the night I got a call that as, he, as, as he was taking his last hit before coming back to God, a young man at the age of 15 or 16 walked up to him and shot him in the back of the head and killed him. Look, I believe he was a true believer. But I believe God said, come on, I'm taking you home. I'm taking you home. There are sins that lead to death. First John chapter 5, read it, the last verses. And there's times where God will say, you know what? I'm taking you home, man. I'm taking you home. But here's the problem with that. When God takes you home, takes you, home you no longer can proclaim the gospel. See, in heaven, you can't proclaim the gospel. Everyone's saved already. So you can't get rewards no more. But here's the other thing. What about your loved ones? Don't you want to be there to share with them? Don't you want to be there when they're going through their ups and downs? Don't you want to be there to try to reach them as much as possible? Well, he lost that opportunity. And God called him home. Listen, there's a danger in playing with the world. It will take you down with it. With, with it. So again, listen, Lot was this individual. This individual, man, who was but it was a believer, I believe. He was saved, I believe. It says right here that he was righteous, right? He was just. But he was worldly. And it cost him, as we'll see right now. Listen. And listen closely. The grace of God saved us. But the world can rob you of the blessings from God. Let's look now into, the, into Lot's bio. 
Now, because of time, I'm just going to give you the scriptures. And I'm going to ask you to write them down if you're a note taker. You know, I do that because at our church, it seems everybody takes notes. Man, I love it, man. I look down and everyone's writing down. So that's why I say that a lot. If you're taking notes, if you're taking notes, because I love to take notes. So if you're taking notes, here it goes. You can jot these down. In Genesis chapter 13, verses 5, 5 through 12, we have Lot's bio recorded for us. And here's a summary. You see, Lot was Abraham's nephew. We know that. We know that God had called Abraham out of Mesopotamia and made him the father of the Jewish nation. When Abraham went to the land of Canaan, we know that Lot went with him. Now, I'm sure that Lot loved God and was saved. As we were told, he was a just and righteous man in 2 Peter 2, 7. Abraham and Lot had a lot of flocks and herds, right? In fact, there was not enough room, gazing land for both families as Genesis chapter 13, verses 5 and 6 notes. And then what happened that we note that there was a dispute among Abraham and Lot. And Abraham said to Lot um, that he didn't want to argue. And for the sake of peace, he gave him a choice to pick any land that he wanted to go. Genesis chapter 13, verses 7 through 9, you have that conversation there. And in verses 10 through 12 of Genesis chapter 13, we saw how Lot chose a specific land that was facing Sodom. He wanted that part. Well, it's interesting because when you read the story of Lot, we see that Lot made that decision based on what he saw. See, Sodom was pulling at Lot, and Lot fell for it. Lot fell for it. Now, I want you to know for you note-takers, again, that Lot wanted all that Sodom had offered. In fact, Sodom stands for the world. It stands for all that God hates. It was a wicked place, but Lot was attracted to it. And let me tell you something. The world is attracting don't get me wrong. If you're saying, no, Charlie, man, I'm holy. I would never. Hey, come on, man. You're only setting stuff up for a failure. Let's be honest. The world offers a lot of good things. But they're bad things. You know what I'm saying? They're bad things. I mean, uh, hostess offers a lot of good bread. <laughs> but it's dangerous, right? I was just talking to, uh, I forgot who I was talking to yesterday. And I was telling them, you know, that um, we're talking about dieting. I'm trying a little bit, okay, so please pray for me. But um, <laughs> I was telling them that one of the ways that, that we're talking about bread and stuff, and I told them, oh, you know, I had to tell myself that bread was, wasn't good, man. <laughs> you know, I, I, I was talking to my brother-in-law instead, in fact, and I told him, you know, I had, to say, I had to say something to me to keep me from eating too much bread. He said, what was it? I said, I remember this, pan is a root word for panza. <laughs> so I said, every time I look at pan, I'm going to remember panza right here. <laughs> You know, even though it looks good, it can be bad for you, right, when you have too much. So, so he saw this place. It attracted him. He flirted with him. He was enticed. And le- later we see he was hooked. It was attracted to Lot. And that attraction pulled him in. So what was pulling on Lot? Listen, the world with its money, its business, its pleasures, its social life. The world could pull on us, so we need to stay close to God and resist that pull of the world, amen? But here's the thing that I noted when you read the story in Genesis 13, and that's your homework. And when you read all the way down to chapter 19, you're going to find that Abraham was a man who sought the Lord. Abraham prayed. You, 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 you read the conversations with God and Abraham. He was talking to God. He was praying. That's what it is. Talking to God is praying. But Lot never did that. Lot never sought the Lord. And listen, that's what happens when we don't seek God. We make decisions that come at a great price. That's what in Matthew 6, 13, it says that we are to seek God first in all that we do. That's my alarm telling me I'm gone too far. But here we go. But I said, they told me I can stay a little bit longer, so you guys are going to have to stay here. Hey, we're going overtime. You know when you go watch a game and in the 10th inning, 11th inning, so we're going to go to the 10th inning for just a few seconds here, all right? Praise the Lord. But I want you to know this. There was a pull. He didn't seek the Lord. Listen, seek the Lord. It's important unless you make a decision that can come at a great price. You see, Lot's decision was economical. He saw an opportunity for, wealthy, for a wealthy future, and he went for it. You know what I noted, though, about Sodom? It was Satan's masterpiece to get someone who was just away from doing what God wanted him to do. It was Satan's masterpiece. You see, there was lust to please the flesh, lust to please the eyes, and in, so- and in Sodom's possessions, there was the pride of life, as 1 John 2, 16 talks about. 
The world flirted with Lot, and he was enticed. He became a friend of the world, and he committed spiritual adultery. Listen, when we compromise and we fall for the world system, we cheat on God. And when we cheat on God, we break the heart of God. The same forces that work on Lot are working on us today. And that's why I'm here to encourage you. Listen, fight off the temptation. Don't bite into it. Don't listen to the devil. He's a liar. You guys know sin never delivers what it promises. Pray that God, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again because I believe it's, it's true. Pray that God will give you stronger convictions in that temptation. But don't fall for him. Now notice, the question I want to ask is, how did Lot end up in such a horrible state? Let me go through them quickly. You ready? Lot moved in the wrong direction. He moved in the wrong direction. See, Genesis 13, 12 tells us that he pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. He did a little compromise, and that compromise came back and bit him. The other thing I want you to know, he, he, not only did he move in the wrong direction, he made the wrong decision. In Genesis 14, 12, it says that he dwelt in Sodom. He moved into Sodom. So first he pitched his tent toward Sodom. Now he's living in Sodom. He inched his way into Sodom, and then Sodom became his home. Became his home. Lot then was deceived by Sodom. In Genesis chapter 19, verse 1, it says, Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. So he moved toward Sodom, then he's living in Sodom, and now he's sitting in the gates of Sodom. Listen, sitting in the gates of Sodom, that was the courthouse where decisions were made. Lot became a city councilman there in Sodom. See, Lot was at home, and now he's working in Sodom. Lot's conscience had become dull. He was no longer shocked at sin. And what used to amaze him now amuses him. To the point that Lot then called the Sodomites his brethren. Genesis chapter 19, 7, he started identifying himself with them. So he moved into Sodom, and then Sodom moved into him. The world conformed and corrupted Lot. A man who was called just. A man who was called righteous now is corrupted and conformed to the world. Scripture knows that Sodom, there was a pollution in Sodom. Genesis 19, write these down, you can read them, verses 1 through 11 and verse 24. You see, Sodom was a wicked place and God had to destroy it with fire, right? So God, if you remember the story, he sent two angels to warn Lot that Sodom was going to be destroyed. And this is important, pay attention. The Sodomites sought to sexually attack these holy angels. Lot, who had been called a just man and a righteous man, had gone so low that he offered his two daughters to the wicked men of Sodom to keep them from the angels. You know the story. When Lot finally spoke to his son-in-laws, this is what's sad, and tried to get them to leave Sodom. You remember what happened? They didn't take him serious. And they thought he was joking around. Genesis chapter 19, verses 12 to to 14, you see that. Listen, some people today in this room say that their works don't matter. They've been saved by the grace of God. They say they they, they can be in the world and of the world and still go to heaven. If we are saved by grace and sin, right, we, we will not lose our salvation, they'll say. But understand something and listen closely. You're going to lose a lot. You're going to lose your family. See, Lot's son-in-law died in that fire. Can I tell you this? And listen closely. We are heaven bound. But some of our loved ones are hell bound. And if we live ungodly lives, the door to reaching them may close. How many times have we tried to win our loved ones to the Lord, but because we're living cardinal lives, they don't listen to us. And you know what's cool that are not cool, but what's sad, that our, our loved ones, they love us and they respect us, don't they? They're not going to tell you, stop talking to them. Some will, but some won't, right? But they're, they're just going to say, oh, okay, I'm going to go with you. I'll go with you. But have you ever wondered what they're saying about you in their minds? Oh, I'm going with you, but in their minds they're saying, you hypocrite. What are you talking about? You were getting drunk last week. 
I saw you curse that person now. Psh, come on. See, with our words, we want to reach him, but through our actions, we're pushing him further into hell. And then when you try to really get to them and tell them about, you know, the Lord is coming back. Look what's going on in the world. They're just looking at you and taking you as a joke. Because you have lived a carnal life. There's a price to pay. When judgment fell on Sodom, fire poured from heaven, Luke 17, 29 tells us. You see, you need to understand, we all need to understand that it costs to serve Satan. It costs us every day. It costs every step of the way. In 1 Corinthians 3, 15, it says, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. You see, the angel had to take Lot by the hand and pull him out of Sodom. But while he was being pulled, his wife turned around and turned into a pillar of salt. Law lost his family, his possession, and the influence he could have had. His life was wasted there. And there is no greater tragedy than a person who becomes a disgrace to God's grace. Because people will laugh at your face when you try to share with them God's truth. In closing, I want you to understand as I sum it up, we need to pull away from this system a system that is trying to work on you today. The world has a prince, a philosophy, and a power, and a purpose, and is working on God's people today to keep them from being faithful. We should never use grace as an excuse to sin. You hear me? Grace should be used as an, uh, uh, as an emphasis to love and to serve the Lord. Yes, we are not saved by works. We're saved by grace, but grace doesn't allow us to sin. And the way to being a disgrace to God's grace, like I mentioned, is by living a worldly life. Is that you today? Is God being glorified through you or is he being blasphemed by you? Are people being reached or are people being pushed away? That's a question you have to answer. But I'll tell you this. I come to tell you, Lord. God loves you, and if that's you, you're compromising, and you're living for the world. I'm here to tell you that God loves you, man, and he, and he wants to restore his relationship with you, and he wants to continue to use you, but you have to turn. Just like when Jesus told the woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more. That's what God wants from us today. Are you with me? Let's pray. You know, Lord, I thank you for the privilege and the honor to be able to speak to your people. Lord, if I came too strong in a wrong way, forgive me. But Lord, I, I come, Lord, because I know, Father, that we, and I say as a church in general, have done so much damage to the message of the gospel through the way we live. And because of it, God, there are people today in our houses that won't come to church. Our kids won't come to church. Our wives or our husbands, our co-workers won't come to church. Because even though they hear us, they see us. And they don't want to be a part of anything that we have represented. Forgive us, Lord. If we have blasphemed your name. But we thank you for your grace that saves us. The grace that restores us. That you allow us, Lord, to confess it and to turn from it. And then here's the good thing, Lord. Then you use us again. Father, if there's any today that need to turn from their ways to your ways, that you will bring them forth. In Jesus' name, amen. So with that, let's stand. They're going to sing. Praise the Lord. They're going to sing, and if they sing, if God has called you to get right with him, you come. Here's, a, here's your, what you're going to have to battle. You ready? You're going to have to battle your pride. Some of you guys are serving here. But you're in sin. And you're going to have to say, you know what, man? God cares for me more than my service. And you're going to have to come and get right with God. The Bible says that God wants a contrite heart above anything repented heart some of you guys are going to have to 
fight your fear, your embarrassment, your shyness. Whatever it is, don't allow the enemy to use that to keep you in the seats. You come forward and get right with God. You matter to God. He loves you. He wants to change you. Listen, Christianity is not a game. It's real. You hear me? And God wants to work in you to work through you. So you come. We're praying for you right now. Everyone else, pray for them that God will bring them. Amen. was deeper my shame was wide your arms were wider my guilt was great your love was greater still Whoa. you ran to me when I was naked you clothed me Depths of darkness into your light again. Oh, into your light again. Cause my sin was deep, your grace was deeper, my shame was wide, your arms were wider, my guilt was great. Your love was greater still. Your love, your love. My sin was deep. Your grace was deeper. My shame was wide. Your arms were wider. My guilt was great. Your love was greater still. You know, with every head bowed and every eyes closed. Look, I'll be honest with you, man. There was a time where I'll be like, oh, no, we'll get forward only a few. Listen, now it's not about me. It's not about this. It's about you. If you're here for the first time and you've never given your heart to God, you were brought here by divine appointment because God loves you. He knows that today was the day in where he was going to tug at your heart and give you the opportunity to get right with God. Here's the danger of you rejecting God. You hear me? The more you say no to him, the better you're going to get at saying no to him. You will only develop a hardened heart. And when you least suspect that the grace and the mercy of God will no longer tug at your heart. And you can get to the point where you cross the deadline. I pray that you respond. You hear me? You get right with God. If there's anyone else, we're going to sing again. We're going to extend it. And we do that for you. Because we know that you're fighting. So you step out from where you're at and you come forward. Let's get right. Get right with God. If you're afraid to come on your own, talk, turn to someone and say, hey, can you go with me, man? Trust me, they'll come, they'll come with you. They love you, man. That's why they brought you here. That's why they came with you. But you come. You got one last chance. Hey, you don't know if you're going to die today or tomorrow. You can walk out of here and you can slip on a, on a banana peel. What is the banana peel doing there? I don't know, but it might just be there. And you might slip on it, fall, hit your head, and boom, you're in eternity. And if you don't have Jesus, I'm telling you right now, you'll be in hell all in eternity because you chose to be prideful and listen to the devil's lies. We love you. Respond. Last opportunity for today. You come. You come. Bring them now. Whoever it is, my God. How how far, how
grace was deeper, my shame was wide, your arms were wider, my guilt was great, your love was greater still, your love, your love, cause my sin was deep, your grace was deeper than the sea. Father, I thank you for those that are here, Lord. And I know there's some still there that are fighting. I pray, Lord, that you will have victory in their lives right now. Listen, as your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, those who are saved and who are walking faithfully with God, not perfect, but faithfully, okay? You start praying for those right now. For the next few seconds, just pray for them. See, there's some here that the enemy has a stronger grip than others. And we need to fight to open them, to open that grip up for them. You know what I'm saying? So you intercede right now. Just start praying. Wherever you are, you come. You come. We're waiting for you. We love you, man. This is real. I promise you what God's going to do, he's going to give you a new start. If you're rededicating your heart to God, listen. You're going to walk out of here <laughs> new again and blessed. Knowing that God has forgiven you, knowing that God has restored you, and now you can continue doing what God has called you to do. And if you're not saved, listen, you'll walk out of here knowing with the assurance that if you die today, you will be in the presence of God immediately because you place your faith and trust in Christ. So last time, if you know it's you, you come. Step out from where you're at, you come. Anyone else? Church, you'll be praying. Praise the Lord, you'll be praying. Anyone else? You come. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for those that are here, my God. Thank you, Father, that you have victory in their lives. With every head bowed and every eyes closed, listen, only God knows why you're here, whether it's a rededication or whether it's a first-time commitment. Either way, for whatever reason, you, you came. You came because God called you. Praise the Lord. After we pray to my level or somewhere, there will be some people here. I'm going to encourage you to go with them. They're going to pray with you. Let them pray for you. And let them just give you some words of encouragement. Trust me, they're going to encourage you. Don't go back to your seat. You go with them, okay? I encourage you to do that. But I want you to understand that this prayer doesn't save you. Jesus does the saving. But through prayer, you're confessing your need of him. You're confessing your sin, and you're confessing your need of him, and you're confessing him as Lord, which is mandatory for salvation. After the prayer, when you go home, it's important that you look for fruits of repentance because you can be moved emotionally and come up and then walk out and, and all you did was just, you just fulfill a, a satisfaction or, or, or you just please your emotions. There needs to be evidence that this was a genuine conversion. There has to be repentance, which means a change of mind, which will lead to a change of life. Please make sure you look for that, okay? But we're going to pray and we're going to ask Jesus to come in today. And to do that work in you. Church, can you join me as we pray as well? Can you guys sing, pray along with us? Say, dear Lord, I know that I am a sinner. You came to die for sinners. You came to die for me. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me. Come into me. And give me a new start that I may follow you other days in my life. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you for receiving me. Now work in me and through me. For your glory and honor. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys, man. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hey, God bless you guys, man. Welcome to the family of God or welcome back to the family of God, whatever it was. Amen. But Lord bless you, man. Thank you.
So where's the hand? Right there. Look, see that guy? That Moses right there. Bro. I don't know your name. Bro. Anyways, God bless you guys. And I think you have one last song. All right, God bless. Isn't God good, church? Let's sing one more song to praise the Lord today. Hallelujah. Family, have a wonderful week. Please pray for VBS starting tomorrow morning. If you need prayer right now, come on up front. Men and women are going to be right here to pray with you and pray over you. Love you, church. Have a great day.